Kevin, I want to th- I want to thank you as a, a, a brother in Christ, but as a guy who I really admire the work that you've done. And Susie, thank you for letting him do that. I know it's it, that that is a. I my, my pastor told me he said, listen, he said you're fixing to go do some stuff and you're going to need to you're going to need a little bit of little extra work, okay? So he said, go read Proverbs. He said, I know you're an Aggie, but it's only 31 chapters. He said, you know, it's, he said, you can, can kind of get your way through this pretty quick. So, uh, but actually I was, I was reading and, and, and in, in Proverbs uh, 15, 13, it talks about a merry heart has a cheerful countenance. And man, you're it. I mean, if there is someone that I have met who has that, that merry heart that, that loves what he does, and, and the, the countenance of a cheerful man comes out, and it is in Kevin Smith. Thank you, brother, for what you do. <laughs> Shannon and you, I, I can't stand here in front of this crowd and, and not uh, just you know love on you a little bit and thank you for what you do and, and uh, for those of you that put this great evening together, all of you. And uh, I, I'm with her. Write your checks. Um, gold is good. Um, if, if you've got any in the backyard, because, you know, if, if, if they print any more money over there in Washington, the gold's going to be good. <laughs> and she will take it. She will take it. So, uh, anyway, the work of uh, Cornerstone Action uh, and, and the Cornerstone Policy Research, I, that, that really is the reason I'm here tonight. And uh, to be a part of strengthening the family and the Granite State. Um, and uh, I, I, this is such a cool state. I mean, come on, live free or die. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's, you got to love that, right? I come, I come from a state, you know, where um, they had this little place called the Alamo, and they declared victory or death. You know, we're kind of into those slogans, man. It's like live free or die, victory or death. Bring it. <laughs> and, you know, I love talking about freedom. As a matter of fact, that's it, it, someone asked me uh, over the course of, of the last, I don't know, 90 days as we were kind of going through this process of getting involved in this presidential campaign. Said, just give, you know, in one word, tell us what your campaign's all about. And I, you know, and it, freedom. I said, man, it's about freedom. That's what our campaign is really all about, talking about freedom. And I happen to believe that government exists to protect our rights and the guarantee of our freedom. And our founding fathers were some of the first in the world to think about that concept and to put it into words. And and they, they declared that our rights were endowed by our Creator. And among those were life. I love it that they start with that one, Catherine. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you know, while liberty may be this gift from God, its preservation requires the sacrifice of man. And Americans want freedom from a federal government that is oppressive in its size and very intrusive into our lives. This week I announced a tax plan. Uh, We were up in, or down in, I should say, uh, South Carolina, and we laid out a tax plan uh, and uh, to basically get Washington out of our wallets and and put money back into our hands and let us decide how best to spend those dollars. And I I called it, I mean, everybody's got a little slogan, right? Um, (coughs) Mine's cut, balance, and grow. You get that, yeah. Cut the size of this government and balance that budget and grow the economy. And uh, it, it, it's pretty simple, actually. Um, or you can stay in the old system that's out there. And, and Senator, you know, the, the ones that want to stay in the old system, pay the lawyers, pay the accountants, all that money that's gone, are that. 20% flat tax, put it on there, take your deductions off, send it in. Even Tim Geithner can get his taxes in on time with this. I'm telling you, he can. You think about it, you know, we spend a half a trillion dollars a year 
in tax preparation. I mean, you know, any accountants or tax lawyers out there, I'm sorry, dude, but that's too much money. <laughs> a half a trillion dollars. And my plan is really pretty simple. It does uh, deductions for the mortgage, deduction for charitable. Yep. You keep that in there. And uh, your state and local taxes are in there. You put those on, 12500 for every uh, de dependent that you have. And, you know, just pretty easy math. Subtract it, send it in. It's awesome. Why not? Why not get it simple? That's what we've done in my home state. I tell people, I say, we have governed in the state of Texas over the last decade by putting some simple principles into place. Number one is don't spend all the money. And, you know, having fiscal responsibility, fiscal restraint. Have a tax system in place that doesn't put a burden on the job creators. A regulatory climate that doesn't put the strain on those job creators. A regulatory climate that's fair, that's predictable. A legal system that doesn't allow for oversuing. You know, I have a great respect for the New Hampshire model. I mean, if you think about no state income tax, no state sales tax. You do that right to work thing and you are going somewhere. Let me tell you, you can put those big signs up. Big neon signs up on the border of the state that says open for business and they will come. They will come. Now, the good news is that little plan that I just shared with you doesn't force the Granite State to expand your tax footprint. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> like 9% expansion. <laughs> I love Herman. Is he the best? I mean, I, get to, I have fun with him. He is a great and interesting guy. And thank you, Herman, for helping pay for the event tonight. In addition, you don't have to worry about paying taxes on your Social Security when you retire with this plan. Under my plan, the death tax expires before you expire. <laughs> Mr. Bill, that would be good. And you can wave goodbye to the capital gains tax. As well as tax on dividends. And on the corporate side, I not only proposed cutting the rate, but ending the loopholes, the carve-outs, all of the, you know, special things, again, that the uh, gravy train of lobbyists and those tax lawyers who have their snout in the trough in Washington, D.C. Like, I want to level the playing field, level the playing field in an open marketplace, uh, free of the special deals that come in too often in Washington, D.C., and I want a tax code that protects and strengthens the family. Uh, we talked about uh, things that I believe in and, and, and why as you were looking around and, you know, you, you, you saw someone who understands that not only some issues here I'm going to talk about as I wrap up, but that it is so important for us to have policies that make our families stronger. And there's nothing that impacts our families any more than those economic decisions that get made in Washington, D.C. or in state capitals. American families shouldn't have to toil more because Washington refuses to spend less. When parents are forced to work an extra job uh, or, or to work extra hours just to make the, the ends meet, they, they spend less time with their children. Tax policy in America shouldn't play a role in breaking apart American families. The most basic unit of governance is the family. And as a conservative, I believe that government closest to the people governs best. There should not be a single policy, not a single policy coming out of Washington, D.C. that interferes with decisions that are best made by the family. Not one. I grew up on a farm. I grew up. I grew up on a farm. 
I tell people, so far out in the country that everybody had their own Tomcat. <laughs> Some of you are not going to get that, but um, that is a long way away from any neighbor. 16 miles from the closest place that had a post office, a little place called Paint Creek. My mother and father were tenant farmers, and we didn't have a lot in the way of material goods, but we were really rich in spirit. There was an abundance of faith in my family and my community. They were, um, there was wonderful devotion to, to family and to community and taking care of each other. Uh, we believed that we were blessed. We were blessed to live in the greatest country on the face of the earth and that we were fortunate to grow up where there was a strong sense of community and that there was nothing, nothing that we couldn't achieve in the land of the free, in the home of the brave. <laughs> this little school I grew up in, um, Mayor, was called Paint Creek. And, and it was very small. As a matter of fact, the motto of the school was um, no dream too tall. For a school so small. <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, I graduated in the top ten in my high school class. <laughs> I know, was that on my resume? <laughs> and then some kid always bust me. They went, well, Governor, how many people were in your class? Thirteen. But the fact is there are millions of Americans that were born in, into less ideal circumstances than ours. They were people who were born into rank poverty, people who were born without a parent. But as a society, we have to stand for the principle that every life is worth living regardless of the circumstance. In America, it's not where you are from, it's where you're going that matters. And in Americans, we must affirm daily the value of life, not just in our Declaration of Independence, but in the way we live our lives. You know, for some... For some people, for some candidates for election... The issue of life is a slogan for the campaign. It's how to get some votes. To me, it's about an enduring principle that innocent human life should be protected in all forms and at all stages of life. And that's why when you were doing your research and you were kind of running down that list of things of people that you wanted to bring here to speak, um, I have consistently been a pro-life legislator, a pro-life governor. I have been engaged with pro-life policies such as parental consent for minors seeking abortion, a ban on third trimester abortion, signing an informed consent law, and I'm really proud to have fought for and signed a budget that defunds Texas Planned Parenthood. I mean, I know Hilar and, and uh, Wizoric, always have fun with your name, brother, and Wheeler have been up here. But again, I want to take a moment with all of you and to say thank you to these very courageous individuals one more time. Thank you, brother. That's a big deal. Unfortunately, this current administration has since provided $1 million in federal grant money to Planned Parenthood in direct conflict with this state's policies. And the bottom line is this. If you want to stop Washington's many violations of the Tenth Amendment, especially when it comes to the most basic principle of protecting life, 
then we must make President Obama a one-term president. We must. Indeed, we must. As conservatives, as conservatives, we believe in the sanctity of life. We believe in the sanctity of traditional marriage. And I applaud those legislators in New Hampshire who are working to defend marriage as an institution between one man and one woman, realizing that children need to be raised in a loving home by a mother and a father. Our obligation, our obligation is not only to provide children with the best environment to nurture them, but to ensure that every child inherits a land full of opportunity. We must give our youngest generation the tools of self-sufficiency through jobs. See, my economic message is based on the simple notion that government doesn't exist to guarantee outcomes, but instead to guarantee freedom. This happens when Washington gets out of the way of small businesses and entrepreneurs. My jobs plan not only reigns in that spending, it reigns in those job-killing regulations. It was in Pembroke, New Hampshire. In Pembroke, New Hampshire, where I saw firsthand okay, those job-killing regulations. During that first week of our rollout, we were at Epic Homes. The CEO there, John Ela, he had let go two-thirds of his workforce because new construction is at a 40-year low in the Obama administration. But instead of relieving the economic burden that employers like John face, you have your counterpart in the United States Senate who is working on a bill that would make things worse for home builders. I mean, under her scheme, federal bureaucrats could take over the local building code enforcement in your city if so-called green mandates are not complied with quickly enough. And this kind of aggressive regulation, well, it's just going to add to the cost of selling new homes. And I would say at the worst possible time that you could be doing that. It is just simply bureaucratic overkill. This has happened all across this country, and federal bureaucrats are doing all of this bureaucratic rulemaking. Under my plan, we're going to freeze all of those regulations. We're going to pull those regulations back. We're going to, the, for the last five years, pull all of those regulations back, test them to see if they do one of two things. Are they actual beneficial or do they kill jobs? And if they kill jobs, they will be thrown out. It's that simple. The federal government shouldn't stand in the way of good jobs for those 14 million Americans that are out there longing to take care of their families. Somebody's sitting around their kitchen table tonight. And they're antagonized. They are full of angst about whether they're going to have the dignity of a job to take care of their families. And there is a way to deal with this. A president who will stand up and say, you know what? The idea that we're sitting on top of 300 years worth of energy in this country and we are not producing it is insanity. A president that will use the office with an executive order, with executive actions to open up federal land so that we can put people to work Nothing I will, I look forward to the day when I can salute to the South, to Mr. Chavez, and say, no, thank you, we do not need any of your oil. We are doing it ourselves in America with domestic energy.
maybe I won't salute him. <laughs> Good jobs. Good jobs for the American economy. Why? Why? Do we allow ourselves to be held hostage by countries that hate us? When we have all of these energy resources, whether it is wind or solar or coal or nuclear or our crude or natural gas, other alternative energy sources, why would we do that? Why would we jeopardize our children's future by creating a national debt that in the last three years has been almost as much as been created in America since we were founded. My campaign is not about appealing, appealing to the Washington establishment. It's about appealing to Main Street. It's about looking people in the eye who are really afraid for the future of this country. They so want a president that they can have confidence in again. A president that understands that the way that you build the economy in America is by trusting the entrepreneurs. That you allow the states to make those decisions, whether it's on tax policy, whether it's about education policy, whether it's about environmental policy. I know the people of New Hampshire. You care more about your environment and your children's education than some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. It is time to end the overregulation, end the excessive litigation, end the bureaucratic intimidation that's going on, and we need to get back to what we know works in America and get this country working again. We've got to cut the taxes and the spending. We've got to balance this federal budget. We've got to grow our economy. And we can unleash American ingenuity again for a new American century, restore the hopes and the dreams of our people, renew our great promise, and entrust the fate of this nation to the hands of the people, setting them free. And I'm for saying it loud and saying it proudly. We are the land of the free. Let's let America be America again and again be the land of the free. God bless you and thank you all for coming and being with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Rick Perry. I, I know you're probably wondering what he said to me. He just went up on the stage here. He said, Kevin, is there anyone that knows the score of the Rangers-Cardinals game right now? No. Um, Again, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for coming. And we have, uh, we're going to actually get you out of here right at 9 o'clock. So last thing, uh, first of all, Governor Perry, you can't leave New Hampshire without getting a couple of, of things, essentials from New Hampshire. First thing is we call this, in New Hampshire we call it liquid gold. But you'll put it on your pancakes and waffles or whatever other southern food you eat down in Texas. But this is pure maple syrup from the state of New Hampshire. And the second that you, re you referenced this already, we know in Texas you all have a motto down there, don't mess with Texas, which, which actually is pretty darn good, though it's a very close second to the best motto in the country, which is live free or die. And we're going to give them a hat with that logo on there. Governor Perry, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Governor. 
What we'd like to do right before you leave is we're going to invite Reverend Carnahan up to give